You might have noticed that throughout the summit we have moved from the global perspective to the national viewpoint, to the network of change viewpoint. Our next speaker brings a highly local viewpoint. The day-to-day -day experiences that we all keep speaking about, we know we need, and most of us has, have not actually taken advantage or accessed. Our mutual desire to change schools and systems for children and families, at the end of the day, sits squarely on community, families, parents, and students. And today's speaker, Bernita Bradley, has lived that experience for years in the city of Detroit, Michigan. There are few cities in the lore of American education policy that bring cold reaction as much as Detroit. And I'm not talking about the weather. <coughs> Bernina has lived and worked in Detroit for decades. We know that she has had to cope with a school system that has declining enrollments, teacher and family exodus, infighting at the school board. Those are the stories that get the media coverage. But we invited Bernita here today to tell us about the lived experience as a parent and as a community organizer to provide an adequate, equitable, and effective school system for children in Detroit. She is an a, a tireless advocate. She's the founder of an organization known as The Village, which helps to secure representation and responsive philanthropies, school systems, and community organizations. She runs a recruiting and training company, training folks to take these roles on these organizational boards. And of course, as a result, she understands the important role that parents and youth can play and must play in building the response, effective responses to the challenges, not only of urban life, but of American life today. In talking with her, and I have to say I met her on Facebook, uh, and, and rang her up and just started talking. And we've been talking for almost a year. And one of the things that she set very clearly on day one was that there had to be a foundation of trust and respect. And that is actually a watchword or watchwords for the things that she expects when she moves in community. So the question is, why did she start Engage Detroit? Well, I will let her tell her story. Bernita? Oops. Guilty pleasure. Oh, oh, oh. Guilty COVID pleasure. I forgot the guilty COVID pleasure. I hear about four blouses that had a 40-hour run on Zoom and PJs on the bottom. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'd like to first introduce our video so I can show you a little bit of, into the life of Engage Detroit, and then I'll go into the why and what next. Historically, in Detroit, schools have really been bad for black children. My daughter was no exception to that rule. During the pandemic, she decided she was dropping out of school. And I said, okay, well, let's try homeschooling. I wanted to know, how do I do this? What's the process? And it's like, if I have this question, what other parents have it? And so we decided to do something about it. I'm Bernita Bradley, and I'm the founder of Engage Detroit. Engage Detroit is a homeschool co-op, and we service black families in the city of Detroit and make sure that they have the tools they need so that they're successful with homeschooling. We offer one-on-one -on -one coaching for families. We also offer field trips and community partnerships that help make homeschooling efficient for families and more equitable. Black families have not been as successful as homeschooling as their white counterparts because they didn't have the tools to do it. We want to make sure that those parents are really rethinking education, because education is every moment. I have five children, and when the pandemic hit, it was so stressful. After a while of doing virtual learning and just being really overwhelmed with it, 
I got connected with Engage Detroit. One, two, three. Parents are the first teachers. And as such, they're capable of advocating for their kids and they're capable of actually teaching them. With every week that we met, Stacy became more and more confident. And it was just amazing to watch that transformation. No, it's not. It's fine. The boys have grown closer. They work together better. They play together better. I didn't realize you can teach your children and you can learn at the same time with them. And that's something that we weren't doing before Engage Detroit. I think the future is so bright. The work we do today is the work that you'll see four and five and six generations from now. I know that it changes lives. To look at my daughter now and to see her self-driven, I'm proud of her. I'm so proud of the commitment that she's made to going to college. I'm proud of the commitment that she made during homeschooling. She chose her own path, and what I did was gave her support in choosing that path. This is an iconic moment for families. If schools won't reinvent education, we have to reinvent it ourselves. And our goal at Engage Detroit is to make sure families have the tools so that choice is in their hands because ultimately every parent wants their kid to be successful. Successful and happy. Thank you, thank you. Yep, thank you for that, thank you, thank you. So, um, I was acknowledged by Georgia Ann Hubbard from Detroit Public Television as a parent who took angry and made it a profession. And I acknowledge that that's who I am, right? Like, I'm okay with being angry. I'm okay with being the angry black woman. I'm okay with being the angry parent who sits at any board table and push back and tell you what you're doing for our children or not doing for our children is or is not working. I'm okay with being that parent who actually brings other parents to the table that you need to hear from to make sure that the work that you're doing is not null and void and that void in 10, 15 years from now, we got children that stay in the testimony that my schools worked out for me and my schools changed for me. So let me tell you a little bit about my life. So that little beautiful daughter you saw up there in second grade, a teacher lost her. I was a business owner, owned an independent living facility and a hair salon. I was not trying to do education. I was not trying to do this work. This work found me. And I remember showing up at my daughter's school one day and the teacher said, oh, Victoria already left with you. And I was like, ha ha, quit playing. Like, where my daughter, right? Uh, she must be in the bathroom. I was 15 minutes later, my daughter was nowhere to be found. When we did find her, my first impulse was like, let me check her, let's make sure everything's right with her, right? But the teacher actually lost my daughter after school. A parent who shows up every day, me or her father would show up every single day to pick her up from school. And I showed up one day and she just wasn't there. And my first impulse was, okay, the rest of this interview is gonna be done via jail because you're going to jail or I'm going to jail, right? Like something has to change because you lost my daughter. But then something clicked, like this little occurrence happened in me where I had to think about the teacher's perspective. Like what was going on in your daily life that you lost my daughter? Come to find out the, the teacher had 36 students in her classroom, seven of them were special needs. She had no pull in or pull out support. And it was like this voice in my head, I always say this voice, but I say God, right, was telling me like, think about what's actually going on here. At that time, our schools were being put into oversight and all type of things were happening with educators. And so I became that mom at the school who was like, from that day on, any baby walked in and out that door, hey, how are you doing, where are you going? Any parent came in, uh, who are you here for, right? Like I joined the LSCO, which, is, which was the new PTA, Right, I joined that and we became the parents who were crossing kids and through all of that I started noticing all these things that was going on wrong in schools. I said, there's something wrong with our systems. There's something terribly flawed here. When teachers are disgruntled, principals are overtaxed, and most importantly, parents are not heard. And so that led me to join AmeriCorps. 
So I took a vow of poverty for two terms, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna scale back, quit doing you know, some of my work at the shop and all of this kind of stuff, and I'm gonna, like, I need to be in these schools, and I prompted other parents to be in the schools. That eventually led to me working uh, with Detroit College Access Network, planning college tours for young people, and eventually Excellent Schools Detroit, where I helped to manage the enrollment process for the city of Detroit, what we hope to be universal enrollment for our city to make enrollment equitable for children. Like we started noticing that we had school deserts. We started raiding schools and we would train parents to go in and say what a safe and caring environment looked like. That rating combined with their growth and proficiency rates from the state came down and gave those schools an A through an F grade. Everything from early childhood programs to K-12, I began to rate those and send parents in to rate them. But then we still found like there's something wrong. There's something wrong, nobody's working together. And my whole heart throb as a parent is if you really care about the kids, why aren't we talking to one another? Why aren't we making sure one another get it? So I had the battle between the charter and the uh, public, traditional public schools where people, where charters are trying to take over public schools and they're busting our children out of the city. And I had to remind the schools, you do know if you didn't suck, there would not be a need for charter schools, right? You do know if you had not failed our children for generations, then there would not be a need for charter schools. So everybody's attacking choice, but yet on the outside, everybody's seeing Detroit has a boatload of choice, but our choice is still stagnant and it's still not what our children need because nobody wants to work together. Everybody wants to battle for dollars and children in seats while our children are our most prized possession, they are your most hottest commodity because they become numbers in seats. And that is the biggest, most catastrophic issue that our children are facing. When all they, they're seen is, is dollars. Or for count day, they get like these beautiful toys presented, or you can wear a free dress today because you're gonna come to school, right? Like send all your children, send the children that they even deem bad. But tomorrow we go back to everything is normal. So prior to the pandemic in 2018 and through 20, we only had 16% of our children reading on grade level in the city of Detroit. That schools all across Detroit. Only 16% of our children were reading, reading on grade level by third grade. We also had this new law that was being implemented called the third grade reading law that said if they weren't reading on grade level, they were gonna be left behind. But there was no accountability to make sure that schools were actually implementing something to make sure these children were going to be reading on grade level. How redundant is that? Right? That's like going home saying, I'm going to pay the light bill and I'm going to turn the switch on, but the lights are still going to be off. But you're expecting, you know, that the energy company cares and they tell you, we don't care that you paid your light bill. So children were being disadvantaged even more and more marginalized. And so we had a pandemic. And so during the pandemic, of course, everybody went into action. Teachers, parents, students. My daughter had only one interaction with a teacher from March to May. And my daughter is a lover of education. And not to toot my own horn, but she's Bernita Bradley's daughter, right? And so children like ours are always welcome in people's schools. Like the highest performing schools want our children because they know we're the parent advocates and if they see Bernita Bradley's daughter is sitting in my seat, then oh, that means other children are gonna come. Not realizing we gonna call you out too, if you're wrong, right? And so my daughter and a group of her peers, she was in 11th grade, uh, worked together for four months supporting one another with no teachers. In the interim, I'm having conversations with parents who were tapping out. Like I saw it all on social media. I'm very active on social media with all the parents and, I, and they were tapping out. They were like, I can't do this. I don't have the tablets. I don't have electricity. Um, excuse me, I don't have the um, Wi-Fi. Like I can't do this. I talked to the teacher and the teacher told me, well, don't you have a cell phone? The teacher's like, the mom's like, I got five kids at home. I don't have five cell phones, right? Like, 
there was this disregard for our most marginalized children and how they were learning, but yet I live four blocks from Gross Point, which is the richest community in our state, and those children went home day two with tablets. So they were learning from March. Not to say it was perfect, right? Because I know there's a lot of people in here who say, well, the richest communities were struggling too, right? Everybody was doing pandemic learning. Let's acknowledge that, right? But the reality was our kids were sitting home for four months with nothing, and all parents were getting told was be patient. Be patient. We've never been through a pandemic. Be patient. We had a board member <laughs> who took the social media and she made it her point to actually scrutinize every parent that asked for help from the district. She shamed parents and she kept blurting out excellence. Excellent. Well, we as parents, I need you to act like excellent parents. We as black families need to be uh, more excellent. I said, first of all, who are you to claim excellence or not excellence? A parent said they need a tablet a parent said that they went to the school for a lunch and the school was closed. A parent said that they have, their child has not arrived on a classroom. I mean, their teacher hasn't arrived on a classroom for the last two weeks. Parents are asking legitimate questions and all you're doing is pushing them back. And so we ended up writing a cease and desist order against that parent. And so one thing about me, when you make me angry, we come after you. So though I'm really nice in rooms and all of that kind of stuff, and I and, and li literally have frenemies everywhere, right? Like I have these friends who are my enemies who are like, Bernita, we're scared of you. <laughs> and I'm like, I love you. Do right by kids. And so these board members were literally disregarding the help and support that their most marginalized students wanted. And they kept putting parents up on TV screens saying, oh, it's working perfect for my child, but those were the bake sale moms and dads. Those moms and dads whose kids are the star players on the team, they get all the straight A's, they're probably connected to the district, they may have a family member on the board, but those were the faces that people were seeing trying to say education was going good during the pandemic for their children, but we are having all these complaints over here. And so we started realizing parents were tapping out, parents were logging off, and as much of a proponent as I am for choice, I am not a proponent for parents tapping out. The learning loss would be devastating. It's already devastating for our children. But for any parent to say that I'm just gonna take a year sabbatical and my child will learn nothing, that was only gonna do them a disservice. So I said, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? So we started doing these online uh, sessions with parents to say, what do I need to do to educate my child if I want to homeschool? Like, what do you want to do, mom, right? Like, what do you need to do? We got some of those coaches. They were just my friends at that time. Like, I start corralling parents who had been homeschooling forever and had been helping other parents. And I'm like, let's talk to these parents. We started doing it just playing on live. No funding, nothing, just to do it. And... Parents were logging on to homeschooling, and they were logging out of public and charter schools. And so my daughter came to me in the midst of this around June, and she said, yeah, Ma, so if my 12th grade year is going to be like this, now mind you, she had a two-year plan. She was like the gentleman said earlier, she was going to take a year sabbatical and travel through AmeriCorps. She like, I told her, you can do your leap year, your gap year if you want to, but I need you to have a plan. We had planned this for two years. She was gonna stay in Georgia. Um, then she was gonna go to Georgia, Piedmont afterwards, like all these levels that she had planned out. And she sat there and told me, if school's gonna be like this next year, I'm dropping out. And I'll just probably take my GD, cause I can't do this. My daughter loves learning, she loves teachers. She is still the one, and I keep saying it, that bring the apple to the teachers. Every holiday, my daughter is bringing some care package to her teachers, even teachers she don't like, y'all. And I'm like, you do know, you just told me you don't like that lady, right? Like, I'm not as forgiving as her, just be honest. And, but she was bringing things to teachers all the time, and, but she had no interaction with those teachers. Every time she tried to reach out, they were telling her, oh, here's the packet, like, just do the packet. So long story short, I said, so what do you want to do? Because you're not going to drop out. That's not going to happen. 
She said, well, why don't you homeschool me? She had asked me in fifth grade, and I was like, nope, I don't want to be your enemy. I'm not about to homeschool you. I'm not about to be at a desk all day, like, get it done. No. We on college tours and stuff when she's in fifth grade. My daughter has been to almost 40 colleges across this country. So she was ready for life, but the pandemic broke her and the interaction with teachers broke her even more for a minute. So we started homeschooling. And as we started the journey of figuring out what we need to do homeschooling, I dare not, there's no work that I've ever done that I've done just for my child. So I said, okay, if I'm gonna get coaching for me to learn what to do for homeschooling, what do I need to get for these other parents that we've been, we've been talking to on social media and they've been coming on lives. So the parents said, I just need a coach. Like I just need the answers to know what to do. I need to know my rights. I need to know policies behind it and everything else. Like I even, even need to have bravery because my child is ready. The children are ready, y'all. They are ready to be engaged. It's us. We're the ones who need the paradigm shift in the mind. And when I say us, I mean homeschool parents, charter school leaders, public school, traditional public school leaders. It's us as the adults who need to change our minds and change our thinking and our thought processes about making sure children get it. So we started on this journey. We have three coaches. We have a coach for high school parents, a coach for junior high, and a coach for pre-K through fifth grade. The coaches meet with families totally free of charge uh, once a week for an hour, private coaching, and they just talk about education. What type of curriculum should I choose? Have you talked to your child about what classes they want to take? Have you talked to your family and your household about what other supports you would have? Have you talked about what transcripts you need to be creating for your children? Because we want children to learn. Like not just be at home, we want them to learn, but we want them to know that learning is fun and it is everywhere. I watched a little boy, one of the little boys on the video, go from being a student who was constantly called home, sent home, his mom was constantly in the office because they said he wasn't paying attention in school. He would write and do his work and, and on his papers he would, you know, he needed color. He was like, I want multiple colors for my math or for my English or whatever I'm doing. And the teachers would mark his stuff wrong because they didn't want colors. But during homeschool, he got to write in any color he wanted. He began to bake. He began to actually do science projects. And we purchased science projects for homes, for families, just so that children could love learning. And what started happening was those same parents who, those same parents who were tired of sitting in offices were sending me text messages of children on Sunday bringing work to their parents like, Ma, let's do this project. Let's do this math, let's do this. Like excited about learning. And so we started out with a group of 12 families blessed by the National Parent Union and the Vela Foundation to fund that and got a lot of notoriety. And in that people were asking, well, do you think this is gonna last? Do you think, it, well, this is just pandemic time, right? Like this is, that's, that's what's happening. I'm like, nope. This is a new revolu uh, revolution. Like parents are tapping out. Detroit Public Schools had a 64% truancy rate last year. Where are those children? Where are the children from all the districts that are missing? A lot of those families have tapped out. My concern is that they tapped out and they've just literally tapped out and may not be doing anything. So that's why we invented Engage Detroit because I don't dare want a parent not to know what to do when it comes down to education for their child. And so because we are our first children's educators, we got coaches. Like kids have always had coaches for football, for baseball, like you know, soccer, everything. Cheerleading coach, parents are the ones like, duh, what do I do with this little human? Like, I do not know what to do here, right? Like I wish she came with a manual. And so now we have coaches to help you even navigate that. And I'll tell one more story. I remember my daughter, so for her 12th grade year, I was like, you need, I, I set up and took out her uh, transcript that she originally had for high school. And I was like, you need to take chemistry. You need to take this, you need to. And she was like, I don't wanna take that. I, oh, you're gonna take this. And so I shut down on my daughter and I stopped talking to her. I told her, I said, until you talk to me about this, we're not talking about the California trip. We were supposed to be coming to see Christina. And so I told her, I said, uh, 
I went and talked to my coach, because I got coached two y'all the first year. And I was like, yeah, so Victoria wouldn't do this, so I shut down on her, and I told her I'm not going to talk to you. And the coach let me talk, and I told her everything about it. And she said, well, why you do that? I said, well, because she wouldn't do her work. She said, well, you do know homeschooling is inventive. Did you ask her what she wants to do? Now, here I am acting like schools who's not asking children and families, what do you want to do? What's the solution for you? So I went back to my daughter and I asked her, OK, what do you want to do? you got to take a science class. She said, well, actually, I want to do forensic science. I'm like, what the heck? How you go from chemistry to forensic science? But in her mind, she was like, this is what I want to do. And she aced it, y'all, right? This baby now is in college. So she got accepted in college without a transcript and without taking tests or anything, right? She went to college and actually wrote her story to Wayne State University, a university in the middle of our city that hardly ever accepts full rides for young people like my daughter or give out full rides. My daughter has a full ride at Wayne State. Her first semester, yep, that's a good place to clap. I, clap. I see a couple of people clapping. Yep, 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 yep. Victoria Bradley. My daughter is also, she's one of two students selected out of the whole United States to help plan what education looks like for the future of learning for our young people. There's only 18 in the whole, United, whole world who were selected. She was selected as one of two. And so she's planning right now, what does education look like in emergencies and crises for young people like me who were disadvantaged? Her biggest concern was, I got pink hair and they're going to say something because <laughs> her hair is a different color almost every other week. But I said all that to say, you guys, that our children have the answers. Our children are ready. They're waiting on you to be inventive. I am so honored to lead Engage Detroit. But I am also honored to walk alongside men and women who would sit in a room to try to rethink and reimagine education. Reimagine education has become just a, a passing thought as people want to reopen the world. And now people want the norm back. I challenge you not to just want the norm back. The norm did not work before the pandemic. It was not working for our children. So what makes you think it's going to work now? We've had 20 months, 24 months woo, of a pandemic. And at the 20 month mark in Detroit, guess what they were doing? They sent families home for Christmas break. Didn't tell families when they were going to return. Families found out three days before the break was supposed to be over that school was not going to reopen. And they had no tools for learning. Parents were again online. I need a tablet. Can I get some, like, can I get some Wi-Fi? Like, my children didn't get a packet. And they were telling kids again, be patient, it's a pandemic. 20 months later, it is redundant that we have not learned from this situation. And if we choose not to learn further, it is our fault as the adults. And it is your fault as the leaders if you choose not to take on some new norm and learn from parents. There's a model called the WITH from the Kettering Foundation. What does it look like to have a government produced not for or by the people, but with the people? In this stance, you guys are acting as the government. The only way you're going to solve your problem is by working with the people that you're talking about, with the families that you service, and stretching your mind and being OK with, this ain't going to go my way. All of it's not going to go my way. But we need it to go the way of the children. And so our systems, our schools, our country is no better off than the education we provide for our most marginalized students. So while innovation is out there, I challenge you all to please fund, partner with. Schools can partner with homeschool co-ops. In Detroit, Dr. Vitti has been clear that our, illiteracy, our literacy rate is too low in the city of Detroit for adults, so he doesn't think homeschooling is beneficial to partner with. 
but I did remind him that you do know those very same parents you're talking about are the ones who fought for your job back and who changed policy to make sure that we had a board in the city of Detroit. Parents did that. And so while there's people who don't think that parents are compatible to be their thought partners, know that they are the only thought partner that you need and they're the most, most important ones that you need at the table. So that's all that I have to say and thank you. Yes. <laughs> I can't imagine a more impassioned need in our country than figuring out a way to seriously, sincerely, and authentically uh, partner and advance the interests of parents and children. And what you heard from Bernita is a story that's played out over and over and over again across the United States. Families that are thwarted, families that can't get resources for their children, families and students who are marginalized and ignored. And what I have said about Engage Detroit is that they are the point of the spear. That I think after the long time of being marginalized and then have it rise to crisis proportions uh, in the last two years, that it would not surprise me at all to see a much stronger exodus out of schools that are not responsive. I think the comment I made earlier about districts being on the point of collapse, um, you'd think that that would be a pivot point that would make people sit up and take notice. But what institutions tend to do is to double down on what they've already done. And so I'm not optimistic about uh, finding great uh, responsiveness, great uh, adoption of uh, an open heart and an open mind. And so finding ways to develop and support alternative ways to educate our children whether it's individualized personal instruction through online education, whether it's supporting a hybrid model of homeschool and online school, whether it's developing a national network of learning pods or other models that we haven't actually talked about today. I think this is the decade where we're going to see lots more of that and give us the opportunity to learn from that, especially if you happen to partner with researchers. Uh, I think that there is a learning curve ahead of us that I think is going to be an important contribution to the way we evolve, the way we educate our kids. So with that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. We have microphones ready. Is there anybody who would like to, uh, to raise a hand? As a teacher, it was probably one of the hardest decisions my wife and I made to pull our kids from the educational system. We did it for their emotional well-being. That it wasn't just the learning, it was surviving. But our children are our most important asset, as you spoke of. How, how can we, as parents, convince our schools to be more responsive to us, other than just walking out? Yeah, so... Um I will say I've never left the school until I've literally done the deepest dive I can do all the way up to the leadership. Like I've never, I never, right now I work with so many parents, like I still do this work of advocacy for parents in the school system, right? And I will go from the teacher to the principal, to the superintendent, to the special ed teacher, whoever, like to advocate, advocate for the mo to the most highest. And then when we see that it's not like you really don't have a concern for children, like you really, really are not trying to hear, you know? And I'm not just talking about in the attitudes of I'm tired of hearing you, mom. I'm talking about that they literally shut down. Then at that point, it's like I can't advocate here anymore, right? I need to advocate on a policy level. So that's when we need um, high quality schools as a civil right. That's when everybody in here needs to be fighting for that 
So on a federal level, schools don't have permission to continuously fail children. We don't have that in Detroit. We just got a right to a basic education in 2020. Look up Gary B versus Snyder. It turned out to be Gary B versus um, Whitmore. But we just got a basic right to it. That means all my children have a right to is reading and writing. While our, again, our counterparts four blocks from my house have a right to everything. And that wasn't in Michigan, that was in Detroit proper. So checking even those policies and laws, you know. And I hate to say just that, that as a blanket answer, but that's the best answer I have. Advocate as far as you can, but when you see it's not working, leave. So let's talk about a little bit about the organization of homeschools, uh, uh, homeschooling pods. Uh, one of the things that we heard Romy speak about and Russell and speak about earlier today was that uh, we've lost the ability to measure what kids know, what kids are interested in, what kids want in their lives. And I would say that there is considerable uncertainty about the future of assessing kids through public means going forward from here. But in a homeschooling environment, that requirement goes away, but the obligation to ensure that you're actually moving your kid and enriching them and developing them remains. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do in order to know how kids are learning? Yeah, so two things I'll talk about. So um, because of most of the work that I've done in the community, I have all these partnerships like with Detroit College Access Network, Wayne State, Michigan State School of Music, and some of the same partnerships that the schools use, I went to those partners and was like, so I have these kids and we need services. Like, can you help me, right? And they were like, well, we've never, we usually only, well, we have these kids, can you partner? And I got, so I have about 19, 20 partnerships that we've created. Some of those partners have evaluation processes also, like DAPSEP. Detroit uh, area pre-college and engineering. They offer these assessments to help families know whether their children are on grade level. They take the math courses at the end, you get reports back, right? So that's one way that families are tracking. Albany State University actually partnered with us to do an assessment of the parents and children. How do they like this process? Um, the reality is everybody that chooses homeschool is not going to stay in homeschool, and they're going to go back to school, right? But the other part is there are parents in homeschooling that actually want the assessments. They want to know how their children are doing. They just don't want jacked up curriculum or the jacked up services that they've gotten from schools. But they are willing to partner with schools. The Niles Community School District in Michigan partners with their uh, local public schools so that children are still enrolled in the public school system. The school gets the benefit from those core pupil dollars, you know, and the extracurriculum classes, those funds go to help the child get like art and um, dance or football or whatever it is. And parents have the autonomy to get assessed if, their children want, if they want their children assessed. So it works like in multiple ways. It's just about being inventive because every parent doesn't want to totally be disconnected from schools. They're just disconnected because it's not working. I think I saw a hand over here before. Thank you so much. I know for your daughter, you, you were able to meet, there was an immediate need, right? And you found a path to meet that immediate need. I guess as someone who is an elected member of a state board, I wanna ask you if you've thought about running for the local school board. Um, I won't run for the local school board because our school system, Detroit has so many, um, so many authorizers, I need to be available to advocate on so many levels. And if I need to call out that school board, I need to. But I will prepare a parent to run for that school board. Because of the governance structure. Like you are, it's not a traditional, I guess what I'm hearing you say, it's not a traditional public school system where you'd have an opportunity to run for the board and I get, and represent all the children yes. there. Yeah. Because that's one of the things is, you know, if, if your level of passion and commitment and resilience existed in every elected school board member in the country, then we wouldn't even need to show up here today. 
right? Because yeah. then all the problems would be solved. So, I mean, we have a governance structure where these, like it, that's, it's, it's the reality where a lot of our school systems live. But I think one of the struggles is we don't always get the candidates and the people who serve in those positions that bring the level of commitment to students that you exhibit. So. so shameless plug at the National Parent Union, we have a, a um, epic parent movement where we are training parents to understand what it looks like to be on a board and what it looks like to actually take those seats and challenge those seats. Um, I was very clear with Corletta Vaughn, um, I probably shouldn't have said her name, but the board member who called out parents um, that if you don't, I will take your seat, right? Like I will take your seat just because you're being the type of person you are. So I'm gonna need you to back down, right? But we are training parents to do this on a consistent basis. But the other part is, what does it look like to be on a board that actually has the autonomy to fire a superintendent who is not doing the right, right by the uh, schools? So that, that also comes in with changing policy. Like what power do some boards really hold? And what power do some boards hold if we have one parent on there, but the rest of the board is still bent on it has to be school as normal? Oh, no, you need coalitions. I yeah. think there's no, if one person on a board doesn't, doesn't make a difference, you need the coalitions. Um, but I do, I, I was curious to see if you, you had thought about it. So yes, I have. thank you. And I really, I admire the fact that you have been such a champion for your own child, but also for other people's children. Yeah. So. And I'll say, if I can say this really quick, so all the parents that uh, come apart, become a part of our program, we make them sign on that you are not doing this change just for your child. So you are becoming, it's a pay it forward concept, right? Uh, we move from 12 parents to 44 parents, and we have over 100 children, but 78 who are actually homeschooled because we have some schools that are, some homes that are hybrid model. So we do a pay it forward model on the other side of the other work that we do. Uh, several states have been passing laws or considering laws to give parents the right to sue their school district or even sue individual teachers if they don't like what they're teaching the kids. Often that has to do with curriculum, of course. Uh, is this a good approach, taking it to court? I think anything's a good ap approach to taking it to court because it sets the precedence of accountability. Right, uh, we need accountability in our country for education. That's one of the problems we don't have, right? Um, we got all these billions of dollars sent into school systems that actually had no rubric. So they decided that they were going to only increase teachers' pay. Or we even had rumors of people talking about paving, uh, paving the teachers' parking lot. Why are you paving a teacher's parking lot during a pandemic? What are you doing, right? So that's accountability. Those accountability measures have to exist. If they do not exist, then people constantly, you're throwing money down the drain by constantly giving money. Somebody on Twitter made the suggestion that we start collecting a list of the farcical expenditures that we hear about from these funds. Um, the one that I loved was maybe we could um, hire a masseuse to come into schools, maybe once a month, and offer uh, neck and head massages to teachers, and that this was a way to address their socio-emotional needs. That would be my personal contribution. Maybe others at the reception would be able, willing to share some of their ones that they've heard about, too. Are there other questions? Where are we? Oh, great. Chris, please join. Uh, thank you for your, your talk. Um, we've spoken a lot during the day about the power, unleashing the power of local authorities, of parents, and so forth. The history has not always been great. Um, sometimes minorities have been hurt, LGBT kids have been hurt, kids with disabilities, poor kids pushed out of districts. How do you think about balancing local empowerment and um, certain principles about protecting vulnerable kids? Yeah, so um, I believe any committees that we have, like we had the Coalition for the uh, Future of Detroit Children in Detroit, that consisted of um, clergy, parents, students, charter school leaders, public school leaders. Um, parents were parents from all over, like 
you know, socially disadvantaged, you know, economically dis dis disadvantaged, I should say, and parents who are like me, like already in the charge, right? And so you have to check even who's on your committees to make sure you're hearing everybody. And I'm a believer in when we need to step back, step back and invite those parents to the room. You will always see me say, you want to talk to a parent? Oh, come on, let's go talk to a parent, right? Let's like, you don't have to take Bernita's word. You don't have to take MPU's word. Let's talk to the actual parents that we're talking about who we, we're telling their stories. So I want to push on that. Let, let's go to, back to the, the, the local activism, local schooling, hyper-local schooling model where we now have a micro village responsible for educating their children. Um, Consensus seems to be absolutely essential for that to hold together over time. And yet, this seems to me the place where you're most likely to get expressed differences in viewpoints, expressed differences in values and aims. How do you cope with that in a model where you all have a common not that, right? You're united in, well, I don't want that. But then when you actually start talking about what you do want and how you'll deliver that, then the, the stability of a small group is much more fragile than the stability of a large group. So tell me a little bit about how micro-governance works yeah. in that kind of setting. Yeah, so it's, it's about understanding we are all here for a common cause, right? If we're all here about the children and understanding that we want the best for our children. The richest people in the world want the best for their children. The poorest people want the best appreciating that and valuing that and valuing voices at the table and coming up with common interests. You will never know the common interests you have with a person until you sit down and talk with them. That's how enemies become friends, right? Like you sit down, you have this conversation, you come to a conclusion of what we, what's the most pressing needs out of all our maybe 15 desires that we wanna address. That's how we got the school board for city of Detroit back because we had all these people came together and they came up with about 15 asks from the government. The governor gave us five. One of them was Dr. Vitti's job. The other was to pay off the deficit for Detroit public schools. But those were people, when they first walked in that room, all had self-interest that they thought and all had a difference of opinion about how education and structures should be ran. Parents who did not like charters, parents who did not like public, who thought charters were just trying to annihilate publics. And, and again, we kept the, at the forefront what our goal was. That's the only way that you're gonna organize real change at a lower, you know, in a more smaller group. Mm -hmm. But we need to establish that though in a lar on a larger portion right now because it's the pandemic. Well, I think you will agree that this has been uh, a highly stimulating, interesting, and challenging conversation this afternoon. I want to thank Bernita for joining us at this conference and for sharing her views. Thank you, thank you, thank you.